Welcome everybody. It's good to be back. You know, we had a little hiatus, but sometimes needed. <laughs> uh, you guys can uh, see the slides online. Okay, thanks. I needed that thumbs up. Uh, all right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. We got a three part series on the book of Jonah, and um, it'll end the week right before the fast of Jonah. And I always feel like Jonah comes up and you're like, oh, we should do something for the book. And then like, it's, it's here and it's gone. So I finally actually prepared ahead of time. So looking forward to it. I uh, want to just take a few minutes to do a little intro uh, to the book of Jun Jonah. Nothing too extensive. Just want to give us a little bit of background before we dive in. And, um, and so Jonah is a prophet. He comes in the time of uh, the two kingdoms. So we had the, 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 the one united kingdom and then they broke off into two, the northern kingdom and then the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom being the kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom being the kingdom of Judah. Um, Judah was made of uh, two tribes and the, the rest of the tribes were in the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was kind of the, the rogue kingdom, right? They were, they were more of the troublemakers um, of the two. And um, as we kind of get to the mid, mid, or, or really like the last quarter of the northern kingdom, we had uh, the prophet Elijah, and then Elisha, okay, and then Jonah comes like somewhere after Elijah, uh, after Elisha, sorry, all right, so that is, what is that? Go. It's got a pop-up, sorry, oh, <laughs> Sorry about that. All good. <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that existed. That's right. We had a cockroach run through the church. That's right. We have a cleaning lady. All right. So Jonah comes after the prophet uh, Elisha. And, and Elisha was focused on the northern kingdom. And his message, like all the prophets, especially to the northern kingdom, was look, repent, fix your ways, or else a punishment is coming. Um, but even if the punishment comes, don't worry, there is hope that is going to come uh, with the coming of Jesus Christ. So that, that was like every prophet, that was the threefold prophetic message. And, and in the time of Elisha, one of the things that we see or a theme was that we see God's compassion towards Israel, even though they had like a long like line of successive kings that were just bad and, and they got worse and then they got bad and then got really bad. Like that was the picture of the Northern Kingdom that God, despite the evilness that was in the Northern Kingdom, especially, he showed compassion. They had hardness of heart and he had every reason to, you know, punish them. And he did at times, but he showed compassion. Now we, take that theme of God showing compassion to those who are evil, like you can make a case, okay, well, Israel was God's chosen people, like he should show compassion, right? Or, or the mindset was like, he will show compassion to Israel because they're his people, right? But then we get the prophet Jonah who really pops up and he is sent to Nineveh and Nineveh was not part of God's people. This was a Gentile nation. And so we're taking that theme of God's mercy, but we're extending it, especially in the context of the Old Testament, it's being extended to other nations, right? And that's a foreshadowing, if you will, of what was to come in the New Testament. And remember, like one of the, the recent feasts that we celebrated as a church was the Feast of Circumcision. Why is that feast so significant? Because when Christ fulfilled the Mosaic law, he freed us from the Mosaic law and then put all of humanity under the law of grace, right? So he was the one who, who, ex, 
expanded, if you will, or, or um, made sure that the message of the gospel was for all of humanity. And he fulfilled the mosaic. Law. So it, it's kind of, it's similar, not exact, but it's similar that Jonah now in the Old Testament is showing God's mercy to all of humanity. All right. And we just have this case with Nineveh. Um, when we look at Nineveh as a um, city, Nineveh was set, nestled in the Assyrian Empire. All right. And have a little map here for everybody. All right. So Nineveh is uh, eventually became the capital of Assyria. And, but the Assyrians at the time of Jonah were still a forming nation, all right? Um, they, they were weak at this time, but they would gain strength very quickly. And one of the, the famous kings of the king of the Assyrians was King Sennacherib. If that name rings a bell from the Old Testament, because he was the king who really like, he was really strong and came and he threatened the, the, the Northern Kingdom, which, which capital was Samaria. Um, God held them off for a little bit, but eventually Assyria would come back and, and uh, conquer the Northern Kingdom. Um, but the time of Jonah is before they were strong, right? But they were still an evil, more or less an evil nation. Um, and the, the dotted line is a, um, is what is thought to be Jonah's you know, journey eventually to Nineveh, all right? And, and so that's a bit of the background. And, and what we want to, what we're seeing in the book of Jonah is that God shows mercy because of the repentance, right? But eventually we know that Nineveh as, as a city and as an empire would eventually turn away from it, all right? We know the big picture now, but at this time, like Jonah is given this mission or task of going and being a messenger for God's message. All right, so that's kind of the, the background of Jonah. Any, any quick questions? All right, so I got opening questions here. What are, you know, since we know that more or less know the story of Jonah, we know that there is a resistance to God. But my question for us is what are reasons, okay, that we may resist God? And then I have a follow-up question, right? What are the ways you resist God? So we have reasons and then we have ways. There's a difference, right? There's a motivation and then how do we actually play out that motivation? So kind of opening up, opening question for us all to share or what are the reasons you may resist God? And then what are the ways that you might resist them? Yeah. And just as a quick mic check, everybody can hear us online, like loud and clear? Yes. All right, great. Go for it. I think one of the reasons is like, we know that the, the way of God is not always the easy way. Okay. Like it's, it's a narrow, it's it's a narrow path, right? Like it's it's easier to not like obey commandments and like try and serve and do all those things, right? It's easier to just like lead. Okay. Um, so the reason is we like the path of least resistance. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I think one of the ways that we do that is we like, keep ourselves busy with the other things. Ah. Uh, okay. Right? So things that are maybe easier, but they like, occupy a lot of time. Oh, that's really good. I'm wasting. Yeah, uh, another reason I think uh, is self-centeredness or self-concern. Okay. Self-centered or, or, or just being worried about ourselves. Good. Go ahead, Mark. I was kind of going to say something along those lines, but um, you know, just having our you know, my desires for my own, mm. just conflicting desires, basically. Gotcha. So I may want to serve God and 
know that maybe God wants me to move in this direction, but, you know, I enjoy doing this other thing, you know, so basically just choosing my own mm. will and desires over what I believe to be God's will. Nice. Okay, good. Thank you, guys. These are good. Keep them coming. Not wanting to give up control. Sorry? Not wanting to give up control. Uh, so reason we resist God is, is because there is a loss of control in the process. All right. I like it. Lack of vision. Okay. Lack of vision. We don't see what God is orchestrating. We don't see the big picture. Right? That's, that's a hard one for us to... You know, in, in, in a world where we are just constantly given control, 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 like over everything, you know, when it comes to God, not being able to have control over that is, is different. All right. I think just um, also um, a lack of trust in his promises. Um so just, you know, like it's, it's true that, you know, my life where I see God being faithful in my life, it serves as a testimony that he will continue to be faithful, but sometimes it just seems um, like there isn't necessarily um, a way that he, I, I just, I just don't trust that he's going to be able to, um, to resolve this situation or to, um, uh, to guide me. And so maybe that, that also has to do with control, control and a lack of trust. Mm. Uh, some of you are sharing uh, a grievance against God for something. So we got beef with God. We're not being truly you know, reconcile with them. Right? Those might be reasons why we resist them. Um, I think, Abuna, that the main reasons it's my sin because uh, sins like um, uh, get me away from God and I want to resist because I am in love in, with the way I'm living and I don't want to uh, get closer to God. I mean, definitely, that's a part of it. I think that's uh, similar to what Ed was saying with regards to kind of self-centered or, or just really, and Mark was complimenting that as well, just like, you know, wanting my own own way, which is, which is another way of describing sin. Um, and then, um, yeah, somebody else is saying in the chat, um, it could be with respect to how they are raised, right? Not believing in a high power. I mean, there, there's plenty of reasons, but I think we, we got some good ones out there. Um, you know, what I think kind of going forward, I'd like everybody to just be asking themselves a more personal question are, what are the ways I tend to resist that? Because everybody like tends to do it a bit different, right? Uh, like what Mary said, of just like, you know, we can become or busy ourselves with, with useless things, right? Everybody tends to do it in a different way. We all have our different motivations, right? There's definitely crossover. But what that motivation drives us to is it can be different. And it's important for us as we, one of our spiritual goals is to grow in our self-knowledge and self-understanding is to be able to identify when I am resisting, right? What are the things that I actually do? Right? And if we can do that, then we can sometimes work backwards and figure out, or it can cue us in and say, whoa, I'm doing this behavior, therefore I must be resisting God. What am I trying to resist? Okay, or why am I resisting? Good, good, good. Thank you guys for sharing. All right, we're going to jump into chapter one. Um, and can somebody read verses one through three? Chapter one, one through three. Want us to be focusing and thinking about like what do we think the various reasons Jonah has for fleeing from God? 
right. Whoever's got Jonah chapter 1, 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amethia, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, and went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare thereof, and went down into it to go with them into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Thank you. So we all have like rough understanding of the book of Jonah, but regardless, what are reasons, what are the various reasons why you think Jonah chose to flee from God? Well, if God was asking him to go into a Gentile country, you know, from Israel to the Gentile, and um, uh, it could be fear. I mean, it could be uncertainty or lack of faith mm -hmm. and vision. But I, I would agree with that. I think fear is a big one because, as I was saying yesterday, like Assyrians were, were known to be ruthless. And, and that, that's been confirmed by archaeological digs that found like piles of skeleton of skulls together. So they were a tough nation. And then when you think of you know, Jonah, who has you know, come from a totally different culture, background, and nation, to go in there and to you know, speak the message he was going to speak, there's definitely a fear for his life. I think it's sort of, um, it's something that's seen kind of later on in the book, but um, the reasons is um, maybe just his own sense of justice. Um, later on in the book, he says, you know, um, I know that you're a merciful God and you're going to forgive him. So why, you know, why are we going through this song and dance? And, and, and I think that maybe just reflects more on just him, himself and, and how he, um, what he thinks is just, um, and maybe just his own irritation around, uh, you know, what he, perce you know, how he, how he perceives the situation and what God will do and, and why does he have to go through all this trouble and, and they are not worthy and you know so kind of like what's his point like you know you're referring to some of the latter verses, verses in chapter four um where he says like this is what i told you was going to happen from the beginning god like wh why do i have to go through this All right so what's the point you're going to show mercy regardless um so that's like a, a reason anything else What about like distance? Looks really far enough. Like, do you think that that could be? <laughs> it could be. I mean, <laughs> like if he wasn't compelled enough, like if he didn't see a good reason to do it, maybe he was like, nah. I mean, for sure. I mean, that that's a fair one. Like, if so you're not fun. if you're not all that excited about a trip, like, yeah. and it's far, right? Like, and then you're gonna deliver this message that you don't think is gonna be met with like excitement, like. Yeah, there, there's risk involved. And I, I think what you're saying like, it, is to a point that I, I was thinking of. It's just like, okay, why would a whole nation of idols like turn when a guy like me shows up speaking about a God you have no idea, right? So what are the chances? It, it kind of sounds ludicrous, right? He's almost, you know, you know kind of, calling it before it actually happens, you know, or, or it could be. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, the examples we're, we're sharing about are, are really good. And, and I think fear of personal loss and premature judgment on situations are common reasons why we tend to hold back when we're given opportunities, right? And, and all of us have different opportunities, you know, small ones and big ones to 
to share a message, to, to speak to somebody, um, to speak up uh, and hold our, our, our moral and ethic ground. You know, we have these opportunities, but sometimes there's fear of personal loss. Like what are people at work gonna say if I stand up? You know, there is premature, premature judgment. And this one, like I tend to hold on to is like, okay, what, what difference is it really gonna make anyway? Right, nobody's really gonna listen. Like, do I really need to go and do that or say this to the, that person? Like, you know, I think these are common reasons that we face. And it happens so fast internally that we don't process it uh, fully sometimes. But regardless of the reasons, sometimes we, we tend to forget the power of God's word, right? You know, like, you know, I was picking on myself and saying like, yeah, I don't think like talking to this person is really going to make a difference, right? That's an admission on myself of saying like, yeah, I, I don't believe, okay, that the power of God is really going to work in this situation. And that's, a, that's not a good judgment on my part, right? And, and actually, uh, there's a beautiful verse from the book of Jeremiah, 5, 4, 14, where, you know, Jeremiah was the weeping prophet. Like, he, he, like, had this burden of being a prophet and, like, I didn't like what he did and lamented it. But he did it because he couldn't resist the call of God, right? And, and in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 14, the Lord says, like, it's a beautiful verse where he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I am making my words in your mouth fire, and this people wood, and it will consume them. Right? It's, a, it's such beautiful imagery that you know, of the power of God's word. Like when he sets up the situation, like when he sets up an opportunity for us to share the message, he's doing so and he's putting the word of God in our mouth, which is equivalent to fire here. And he's making the person wood in front of us, right? And we know that fire and wood mix. And I think if we can challenge ourselves to keep this imagery in our mind and realize like, okay, while I'm speaking, I'm not speaking my own words, I'm speaking his words. And a lot of times we get into these moment situations, momentary situations where like, I don't know what to say. Well, what does the New Testament tell us? In that time and in the hour when you don't know what to say, I will put my words in your mouth. All right? That's the power of God. And his words are like fire and those before us are like wood. And so, when we give these, when we're given these opportunities to speak, we have to remind ourselves that God has orchestrated this. He knows kind of the past and the future of this individual in front of me or this group of people in front of me. And he's divinely orchestrated this moment. And he will, he's inviting us to participate. He's inviting us and he's going to supply us with what is needed. And just like Jonah, like we're messengers of his mercy. We need to see ourselves as that. And we need to be learn obedience and you know in the moment and also how to be brave and to trust God. Right? And let's not underestimate the reach of God in these situations. Because when his words come out of our mouth, we may not see something immediately, but God is always at work. Like these words don't go to us. So with that said, let's continue to journey with Jonah. And can somebody read Jonah chapter one, verses four through six? Nicholas, can read. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, some, did somebody else want to read? Sorry about that. No, 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 I think you're fine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nicholas. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts 
of the ship had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that you so that we may not perish. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So here's something interesting for us to kind of wrestle with. Like when you think of Jonah as a prophet, like all the prophets were really what qualified them as prophets was that they heard the word of God. Now we don't exactly know how each prophet heard the word of God, but it was something unique and divine, right? That was out of the ordinary. And as a prophet, like, you know, as an individual devoted to this, this sort of ministry, there's got to be a, if you will, like baseline understanding of God's like omnipresence, right? If he's able to, you know, talk to me in this way, and you know, at this time, and I know he has spoken to many other prophets before me in, in unique ways, there's like some sort of baseline understanding of God's omnipresence, like everywhere, his ability to reach me. And it's interesting that a prophet, you know, or, or Jonah specifically, you know, is reluctant to take up this mission that God has sent him on, and somehow came to the conclusion or thought that he could flee from God. Right? It, it, it's kind of like, you really thought that that was going to work? I mean, you don't think God's going to catch up to you? But yet, you know, he thought he could plead, or he was at least attempting to plead. And it's important because the reason why I bring this point up is our knowledge of God is, is on this continuum, right? And, and regardless of our, our level of knowledge or understanding of God, there's always room to improve in our knowledge and understanding. And the prophets were not exempt from this. They were on a constant like, journey in which their understanding of God and their knowledge of him was continuing to grow. And when we look at like Jonah, he was learning, well, what is the extent of God's reach? Let me try running, but let me learn. Like he didn't know it, but he was testing and saying, what's the extent of God's reach, right? And I give you... An, an example from the Old Testament in which another one of God's, you know, uh, chosen individuals grew in his understanding and the knowledge of God. And if we look at uh, Jacob, Jacob and Esau, you know, Jacob was God's chosen and, and he was a deceiver and, but yet he was chosen by God. And after he um, fooled his brother Esau and Esau wanted to kill him, he left. And leaving your home was like leaving God, right? That, that's what it was. Like God has chosen his people. If you left, it was like you're leaving God, right? It was the understanding. But Jacob left and soon after leaving, right? He has this beautiful dream of the ladder and the angels going up and down and stuff like that. And as he awoke, he realized like, whoa, I've left home. But God is in this place too, right? So there was an expanding of his knowledge and understanding of God. So like Jonah, he is learning. And then this constant state of learning of, of, of God and his reach and his ability, Jacob learned and we learned too, right? We learned too. And when we look at, at Jonah also and, and his desire to sleep once getting on board, right? What do you think the significance of Jonah's decision to sleep is? Like, why, why does that, why is scripture like pointed out? Why is it important for us to just take a few minutes to think about? Like, why is Jonah sleeping? And why is it so odd? It's like a form of escape. Form of escape. I agree. Yeah. You wanna, you know, if something's really bothering you, sometimes I'll go to sleep and try to get some more dealing with it or thinking about it. Yeah. 
but he's escaping physically, and so he's also escaping mentally. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I'd say it's like another, it's another attempt to shut out death. Like I'm fleeing and now I'm going to sleep and kind of turn off my, 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 my consciousness for a bit. And, and it's very unbecoming of a prophet. Like when you think of like prophets, you're like, okay, well, if I could pick what a prophet would do when he was in a difficult situation, it wouldn't be sleeping. <laughs> this prophet should be get up and pray and say, okay, God, bring clarity to the situation. But like Jonah does the complete opposite. He's like, I'm going to run and I'm going to sleep it off, right? This is very unbecoming of a prophet. You know, what I, I noticed, though, the first thing that came to mind when I read that yeah. was that it's, like, very similar to the story about Christ falling asleep in the storm. Mm -hmm. Like, it's really weird. The yeah. idea of falling asleep in the middle of a sea storm yeah. is, like, super weird yeah. because <laughs> that would be really challenging. Yeah. So it just, that came to mind right away. I wonder if there's like some kind of parallel foreshadowing there. Um, there is a parallel, and to be honest, I was reading earlier a commentary of St. Cyril of Alexandria, and he was drawing a parallel, but I didn't, I didn't pay enough attention to it, so I will pull it up and, and, and look at it again. But there is, there is a parallel there. Um, yeah, so we have kind of these odd behaviors of Jonah the prophet. And so let's continue to kind of read the story and we're going to get a sense of what is the extent of God's reach, right? But how does God continue to reach out for Job? Somebody, we're going to read uh, seven all the way through 10, right? And they can read that. Seven to ten. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they said to him, Please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? So he said to them, I am Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of the heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men who were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he slept in the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Thank you. So, kind of reflecting on these verses, what are the ways that we see, like, the persistence of God. Right, Jonah's trying to flee, but we know it's not going to work. How does God reach him? Casting lots and having the people in the boat right. convince them or like wake them up or convince them to. Okay. So casting of lots. Which is like, I, I think of that one and like, I always, you know, so. Every so often people come to me like, Abuna, I had a dream last night. I'm like, I am not Joseph. <laughs> I don't know what your dream means. Do you mean do you think it means a sign? Like, I was like, it could be, right? But like to your point, like signs, right? So sometimes like we do get these signs. And I'm not trying to discredit anybody who has a dream. I'm just not a dream like interpreter. But you know, we get signs in in, in life. And so we pick up some people pick up on it, some people are totally oblivious to it. But to your point, son. So the casting of lots. What are, what are the ways that God continues to reach for Jonah? The storm, the waves, right? 
I was like, surely they will get this one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah the storm. So it's so like roadblocks, you know, and, and, and we experience this. Like, you know, when we, oftentimes when we are running from God, like there is, we, we get stalled in our tracks, right? And we can be very like hard headed when we get stalled and just kind of push forward. But like there are natural roadblocks that come up in, in our own lives, like as we, as we try and run. I think too, just there's something that's hidden from us also because um, Jonah tells them that he's hid from God and he, he, he has a clarity about this when questioned about it, he knows it's him. And so God is also reaching for him by knocking at the inner man. And so we don't see that, but we can assume that that's the case, that just in his conscience, so not just the outer signs, but there's something going on inside of him as well. Great. That, there's, there's an internal illumination that, that is happening with Jonah. And kind of taking me to my, my next point, but the one thing I will add before we move on to that point is that you see also like these non-believers, right? All these sailors who are, you know, kind of poking and prodding and asking these questions. And, and it's significant because like God can use anybody at any time in any way to reach us, right? From child to adult to like, you know, person on the street that I've never met to a homeless individual, right? the ways that God reaches us are, are endless. And, and it's kind of like, it's on us to always kind of, to make that mental note and to be looking for it too. And when we look for it, then as, as Sarah was saying, there's this illumination that happens on the inside, right? And so as he is, you know, you know, uh, pushed by the sailors to say, like, what's going on? What's happening? And Jonah begins to recount the story, right? The, it's the Gentiles, these Gentile sailors, that are reflecting back to him, like, you did what? Right? It's kind of like a wake-up call. It's like, this is your God, and you chose to do this? Like, you're a prophet, and you, and you did that? Like, so it's important to allow life and whatever life may be at that time, an individual or a group or situation, to reflect back to you life, like to, to what's going on. And, and that's really important. So there's this illumination that's happening. And, and with that, there's clarity that is, you know, on the situation. And, and this moment is, is really important because it prepares us to take corrective measures. Right? And that's like, Illumination is one thing, right? But ultimately, we need to take a corrective measure. And that's where Joan is at this, point, at this point. Like, okay, he's realizing, like, all right, tried to flee from God, but God is everywhere. Okay, tried to sleep it off, but he knows how to wake me up. All right, tried to not talk about it by putting myself alone down in the cabin, but the other sailors came and talked to me about it. Like, he will continue to reach. God is persistent. Right? That is, is one of his beautiful characteristics as a father towards us, right? And when we respond, this internal illumination happens, and it prepares us for the necessary corrective steps that we need to take, right? So uh, let's read 11 through 15. 11 through 15. And they said to him, what, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. 
Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life and do not charge us with this innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. All right. So we're, we're talking about this fruits of internal illumination and, and how it kind of sets us up for the corrective steps. Right? And when you think of you know, this process that's happening to Jonah, look at the clarity that he has on what needs to happen. Right? And the clarity is like, all right, I know I'm the issue. Right? Throw me over here. It's such a counterintuitive step, right? Why not just like, you know, say, okay, God, you got me. Like, I'm sorry. When we hit land, I'll go to New York, right? He doesn't take that route. Why? I'm not sure, but I, I venture to say it's because there is a clarity inside of him. And not only is there a clarity, but in addition to clarity, there's courage to take the next step. Because telling the sailors, like, throw me overboard. <laughs> They're like, what? You know, throw you overboard? Like, we already, like, annoyed your God, and the sea is bad, and, like, you want us to throw you overboard and kill you? Like, what's going to happen to us when now we've killed the prophet? Right? So there's this fear of, like, things going to get worse. But yet Jonah, right, was very steadfast in knowing, like, this is what needs to happen. Right? Despite the resistance... He knew what needed to happen. And he eventually like, took those steps. Yes, they had to throw them over, but he really encouraged them along the way. So we, we see like, again, with this illumination, there's clarity, there's courage to take these steps. There's persistence against like resistance, right? To taking those steps. And then like, there's actually like pulling the trigger, right? Like making, making sure it happens. And, and you've probably been in, in situations where like, okay, it's been confusing. You've been running, but God, you know, in his way reached you and showed you what needs to happen. And as you kind of share like with, you know, people that you trust, they may have been like, I don't know if you should do that. But yet there's a reassurance that you have on the inside that says, this is what I need to do. Right? And they don't really understand it. And they, they probably never will. Right? But it's something that you know and you feel on the inside. And that allows you to take the necessary steps. And it's going to be counter to other people's advice. It's going to be counterintuitive to the situation, maybe. And even sound crazy. But God is allowing you to kind of have that confidence, so to speak. To do what's right. Right? Abuna. Yeah. I think too that like in this situation, you know, it's that, that quote, um, if you the most powerful person in the world is the one who has nothing left to lose. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, Jonah got to the end so to speak you know like his his bravery comes from his desperation like he ran and ran and ran and then god had him mm -hmm. i mean he had any he, and he had him all along he showed him he had him all along but you know he's like there's nowhere else to run and to hide so his courage comes from like his back is truly up against the wall now and so he's got nothing left to lose, um, you know, except maybe to take these innocent men down with him. Yeah. So it's time to, to jump. Yeah. Like, I agree. I think like he's realizing not, not only there's nothing else to lose, but there's nowhere else to run. Like, there's nowhere else to run. Himself. <laughs> and, and like the worst situation. And, and I think like there is, like, I don't want to get into his mind and say, like, okay, he knew the fish was coming or not. But, you know, what kind of comes to mind is, you know, when the three youth were, you know, in, in the situation and they said, like, look, 
whether God saves us from the fire or not, like, you know, he's going to use this for his glory. I think Jonah was in a similar situation where he's like, I don't know if I'm going to live or not. Right. But this is just the next step. Right. That's, that's the way I read it. I'm not saying like it is, you know, the right way or the only way. I'm just kind of sharing, sharing my thoughts. But that's why I kind of think Jonah is as, as an individual. Abuna, I was thinking about, um, because I, I like that one part you said about just he, that came from bravery, you know, also. And it reminded me of like Abraham and Isaac also had that just insane clarity when they were like, he, he knew there a sacrifice had to be made. And I was actually listening to something the other day, which I literally had no idea. Um, in my mind, Isaac was always like this young child, but actually he was probably like in his thirties at the time. So for Jonah, I'm sorry, for, for like Isaac to have <laughs> that clarity also, and that bravery of just like completely trusting. He was probably like stronger than Abraham at the time, maybe bigger than him, just having that clarity. I, I just, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think that's like not to be minimized. I love that so much, the bravery and the clarity. Comes with God's like presence, and, and that illumination is the presence of God, right? And so naturally, with it comes like you know courage, and comes bravery, and, and steadfastness, and all the necessary qualities to follow through. It's, all right. What? What yeah. if? What if? There we go. <laughs> Just to play devil's advocate, what if it wasn't a moment of clarity? What if it wasn't a moment of illumination? You know, what if it was in fact the opposite? What if, I mean, it sounds to me that I didn't think about this in like 33 years I've been reading the story, that he probably, he could have, I mean, I can't get inside of his mind, like Abuna said, but. What if he wanted to end his own life because he truly realized there's nowhere he can run from God? And he honestly thought he would die by getting thrown overboard. But then in God's persistence, he sent that fish. Like to me, that kind of um, it's an interesting thing to think about. It's, it's it was a move of, of desperation not because he surrenders to God, but because he surrenders to life. Hmm. I really, I hadn't thought about it until like <laughs> this moment. It, For me, yeah, it was well, yeah, I, it was like, yes, it is illumination. Throw me in, we'll see what happens. But he it, could have, it, it very well could be. Yeah, I think that's a very real possibility too. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily think that he wanted to end his life, but I think he definitely, I mean, definitely, I shouldn't say definitely. I, I would imagine that he thought that was on the table, that that mm -hmm. could have been what God decided. Same thing the three youth thought as well. Yeah. I, I, I was just kind of scrolling during the Bible study, so I didn't really like prepare, but I think Jonah foretold the destruction of the Assyrians somewhere in the Bible. I don't know where. Um, mm, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask about that as well. I think that he knows that this people that he will save one day will come or come and captive his people. So it was. I, I need. I, I wanted to ask you about this, Abuna. So it was mentioned somewhere that he knows that the people that he is going to save one day will come and captive his people. Um, there, so Jonah is not the only prophet that was sent to Nineveh, and I, I should have looked this up, it was in the back of my mind. But there's another prophet that was also sent to, um, to, to Nineveh much later on. So Jonah was a first, and then another one came, and I, uh, Nahum, okay. And Nahum came, uh, yeah, Nahum, like, 
later on came around the time of the fall of the Assyrians um, and, and essentially was you know, saying like, okay, God was very slow to anger with you. He sent you Jonah long ago. And then, and then look, you have turned from God and now destruction is coming. Right, that that was Nahum. So th there is another prophet that did go to Nineveh, or, or, or his prophetic message was uh, targeted at, at Nineveh, but not. To my knowledge, it wasn't Jonah. Jonah's focus was that, like, ah, God, why'd you send me? I knew you were going to show mercy on me. Um, but if you if you find something in Scripture, please let me know, and I, I'd like to look into that. All right, I have kind of one, one or two last points. All right, we spent this whole chapter looking really at Jonah, and and we're going to continue it, um, you know, next week as we really focus on him in the belly of the whale, and then last week like his frustration with God. Um, but when you, when you look at this, like who has heard me say there's the ministry behind the ministry, right? You've heard me say that before, like either in sermon or talking with you, there's always the ministry and then the ministry behind the ministry, right? And I think Jonah is a great example of this. And what do I mean by that? What was Jonah's ministry? It was to go to Nineveh, to talk to them, preach about repentance, turn from your ways so that Nineveh would be saved. That was the ministry. But what's the ministry behind the ministry? Was Jonah, right? Ministry behind the ministry was God working on Jonah as an individual, right? And there's never a time where we don't see God working on the individual and his characteristics and his values and his, you know, all these different things, his struggles, his or her struggles. God is always working on that. But what we tend to see on, on, on the, you know, on the surface is like the ministry, like big picture of Jonah. He went to Nineveh. That was his ministry. That was his call. But we see throughout the book, like it's almost more about what God was doing with Jonah. More of the book focuses on Jonah's internal growth. And the same thing with us. Like we have our various ministries, right? But there's a ministry behind that. And in the struggles of the ministry, like uh, of our kind of superficial ministry or, or you know, what, what people see, God is working on us through the struggles. And I always argue that that is the more important of the ministries, right? If we pay attention to what God is doing with us as individuals through our ministries, like that is where the greatest growth happens. There's always a ministry behind the ministry. And we have to challenge ourselves to look past it to see the deeper work that God is doing. Right? Book of Jonah is more about Jonah than it is about me. All right. Let's go. Let's wrap up these last couple of verses. I'll just read them. Verse 16 and 17. He said, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, All right? You know, and just, you know, the last point to, to, that, that I think is worth mentioning is that we tend to be tunnel vision in, like, what is happening to us, right? And we're, we're, focused, on, we're focused on Jonah. And God is focused on Jonah, but yet he never loses sight of everybody else involved in the picture. And through what is happening to Jonah and how Jonah is, is, is responding with God and responding to God, who is being affected by it? It's the sailors. And these are 
Gentile men who had different gods and probably different ways of living, who all of a sudden were introduced to a God who has control over everything. How? Through God's interaction with Jonah. Same way, like, when God is doing a work in us, he is also doing the work on the people around us, through us. And if we learn to work and respond with God in what he is doing, without us knowing it, he will also affect those around us. So we have a responsibility to those around us to engage with them, to allow him to chase after us, frustrate our ways, you know, speak to us in different ways through different people. And in that process, he will also affect those around us because they watch, they see. We're not aware of it. Why? Because we're so tunnel vision, right? The other people are in tunnel vision. They have a different perspective. How we interact with God affects them. All right? Next week, we'll focus on chapter two, where Jonah is in the belly of the whale. Um, any last questions for tonight? Yes, Abuna, I have two questions, please. Uh, so, sorry, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, okay, so my first question about the ministry, um, I got this uh, conversation with the servants about the ministry, how it's a passion, and how we want to do what's in your heart. Um, but here, uh, another people saying that it's a call, like God called you to do something. Um, so what is what is the service? It's about the call that God wants you to do, or it's about what's in your heart to do? Um, I don't think it's black and white like that. Uh, I'll give you kind of my own personal, uh, not not personal, but like, you know, I think the way that actually uh, uh, Metamistin put it in his uh, book, uh, If You Love Me, he boiled down the ministry as a transmission of God's salvation from one person to another. And when we look at service, like our goal is to, you know, take, you know, our understanding and joy of salvation out of the relationship we have with God and transmit it into somebody else so that they would have the same relationship. I think for people, you know, some people have a passion to do that. Some people do it out of an obedience to God. I think everybody is unique on how we 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 go about it. Like Jeremiah, as we were saying earlier, like he was miserable as a prophet, but he was obedient. Right? He he want like he wished he would die, but he was going to be obedient to God. So everybody is a bit different, and, and so um, I don't think passion, you know, for a typical like for a service is the standard by which we mark service um, because there are different ways that God uses us. Okay, my other question, Abuna, when you say the power of God who's talking inside us, how do you differentiate between this is the power of God or this is my argument, arrogant and being showing off? It's a very confusing part about what's inside us. It is, and, and that's that's. And, and that's why it's important for us to have a greater degree of self-knowledge and self-understanding. Because when, when we become attuned to what's happening in our hearts, we're able to decipher and discern, like, am I saying this for attention? Am I saying this to be right? Am I saying this, you know, out of my own pride? Or am I being provoked by God? Right? There's, there's a difference between them, but it requires somebody to be attuned to what is happening inside themselves, in their mind, in their heart, through their emotions, and to tease out the differences. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right, nine o'clock on the dot. Close us in prayer, and we'll see you next week. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen.
We thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for this day and this opportunity to dive into your servant, Jonah. And just as you worked on him throughout this story, Lord, help us to see ourselves in his shoes and to know that you are working on us through our various ministries and our services. Um, help us to be amenable to the work that you are doing in us. If we are running, help us to turn back to you. If we are not listening, awaken us. Uh, Lord, help us to endure the challenges set before us, knowing that out of them, you bring in us a, a deep transformation, a true transformation. In the intercessions of all your saints who have pleased you from the beginning here, says we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This is day of daily bread, and give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but to live in you all. And she is our Lord, for them is given the time to pray. All right, everybody, have a great night. And uh, something I want to put on everybody's radar is I want us to be thinking about what we want to do for Lent, all right? I want that to be a group decision on what we do um, during the season of Lent, uh, either a theme in the Bible, book in the Bible, something that is going to uh, come just to grow uh, together, all right? I'll be asking you every week, and if you have ideas, either text me or shoot me an email. Have a good night.